yeah, Pippin, there are at least two reasons why I thought it is as if you were doing work would play an interesting role in the exhibition. And uh, one of them is that there is, I think, an increasing use of gamification in the workplace and in, the, in particular in the, in the gig economy sector. Mm. So was this gamification of work something that you had in mind when, when you developed the game? And do you see maybe some parallels between games and work? Mm. Uh, so it's a, that's an interesting question to me. I think it's not the case that when I was creating, it is as if you were doing work that I was explicitly looking to talk about gamification or to critique gamification. But I think it's also true as you're kind of intimating there that gamification or at least tropes from video game design have kind of melded fairly naturally with, I guess, capitalism and the ways that work is increasingly seen, maybe especially as it's become more and more um, something that we do on computers. So mm -hmm. even though I, I wouldn't say that the game is about gamification, it felt extremely natural, I think, to kind of quantify, um, to include quantification, I guess, as a core element of any kind of futuristic vision of work or kind of work adjacent ideas. Um, and I think more broadly, that's because, it, but maybe it works the other way, in fact, which is I think that it is true that games often feel like work. Um, and the, but the idea being that they're a kind of pleasurable work because in a game, generally speaking, you get to feel effective, um, perhaps most fundamentally, right? Most traditional games or conventional games are about doing things that may or may not look like, I guess, regular work, right? Like you, you might be saving the universe, but it's kind of broken down into tasks and you kind of have people who are asking you to do things for them on a deadline, <laughs> like save the universe. Um, and you kind of get to do them and just get them done, which is, that's maybe the moment where games depart from our experience of work um, in day-to-day -day life, where things are much more complex. Um, we're often heavily reliant on other people uh, to get things done. And all of those things kind of interfere with the pleasure of completing tasks and getting things done, which is a pleasure. Um, and so I think that games can be like a, almost like a perfected form of work. And that with gamification, maybe the the world of labor and particularly, I guess, internet companies and so forth have kind of seen that idea that games have found ways to make what is effectively labor feel good to players. And they're kind of folding that then back into, um, into work by having point systems and bonuses based on that and so forth. Um, so... I guess the answer is kind of yes, right? Like I think that games and work are heavily intertwined just in their very nature and especially in today's uh, work culture and game culture. And so that kind of naturally fed into my portrayal of work in the game. Um, so yes, something else that I wanted to share with you is that uh, I love it is as if you were doing work as much as I hate it, because it's kind of an irritating game to play. I, 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 I had to stop because I was getting a bit angry. I really wanted to see how far I could uh, evolve in the game, but I gave up after the second pop-up that asked me to write yet another, another email, and I thought, well, <laughs> It's just laughing at me, and this is. I, I started suspecting that it would take hours. So I was wondering, can you say something about the playability of the game? Because I think, um, and it's something I admire, I admire really in your work, is that your first concern is not about the player uh, laughing and having a particularly pleasant experience, an interesting experience, a challenging experience, but not a, you know, a traditional playful experience. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that's, that's absolutely accurate as a characterization of the kinds of things that I, that I end up making. I don't think that I, um, when I think of a game, I don't set out to be uh, frustrating or challenging. I think the way that it transpires is that I'm, I think of an idea 
first, you mm -hmm. know, um, maybe something that amuses me in the shower or while I'm walking down the street, anything that makes me laugh uh, for a moment. Uh, and certainly, for example, this idea of a game where literally all that you do is you interact with standard user interface elements and that that is the game um, is something that I thought was amusing from the first moment that I thought of it. I actually, the very first genesis of the idea was that it would be a game with uh, a slider, you know, that you move up mm. and down to, to different settings and it would just tell you set the slider to nine and you would do it and then that, you would get points or something and then that would be it. That would be the game instead of that being um, a standard user interface interaction would be presented to you. I would tell you it was a game and ask you to play it, which I thought was very funny um, as a as a way of working with user interfaces and as a way of talking about like what's the minimal sense of what a game can be. Um, and so I pursued so I pursued that idea and it, it turned ultimately into this larger experience um, in it is as if you were doing work. But there's never a point where I was trying to think about, well, how can I be extra annoying? Um, I think it's all, it all starts to come down to how can I be true to the idea that I'm trying to communicate or the mm -hmm. thing I'm trying to explore. Um, and I think in particular, the thing that I'm really interested in, and perhaps this is why the games can be um, uh, frustrating or, or feel weird, is that I'm interested in inviting the player to explore the idea uh, in the same way that I am when I'm designing the game. So it's asking you to think about what you're doing while you're doing it, which is often um, can be kind of alienating when you're having mm -hmm. an experience that's, that's against immersion uh, in a sense, which is a coveted uh, feature of how games work. And so the outcome of this, right, is if you have an idea and then you just pursue it as kind of this ground truth of, of, of your work, um, it's generally not going to fit in with ideas of playability and entertainment um, and so forth because it requires a huge amount of very sophisticated work to create a, a fun game or an engaging game. Mm. Uh, and it requires, I guess, fitting in with traditions and definitions for players and player culture of how those things work. Um, and you kind of can't, I, I don't feel like you can often do both at the same time. It, it, it can be very difficult to have a thing that is fun and tragic, for example, or... Yeah fun, but also deep and intellectual. Like these things, they can be jarring together or they can simply not support each other. And so it's always been my practice to kind of pursue the, the line of things, which is about communicating the idea um, and using the game form to express it, regardless of whether it ends up being fun and regardless of, of whether people on Reddit hate me or not. Um, because uh, well, thank you. So the part for the for the for the exhibition is going to 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 stop here. Because you said the the word tragic, I want to ask you about your interest in Greek mythology mm -hmm. and the reason why I was um, so interested in it is that actually I studied uh, at the university. I studied classics. So okay. I used to be a teacher of Latin ancient Greek. So suddenly finding Greek mythology in the context of your of your website was completely unexpected. <laughs> so why did you decide to dedicate the whole series to ancient Greek punishment? I mean, it's not anything; it's punishment. Yes, it is very specific. Um, that's it. Like that's a pretty interesting one because I've been working on. I think I made the first Greek punishment game in like 2011 or something. So it's been a decade, which is horrifying in terms of um, age and all of those sorts of things. Obviously, but um, that's a very long time to still be interested in something, and I think that really speaks to you know the power and the kind of the fundamental nature of those myths. Like they're so relatable they're, they're very simple of course which makes them um, relatable and applicable in a lot of contexts but um, they're just such powerful simple distillations of mm. I mean obviously like an amazing story if you think about some of the specifics of Sisyphus and you think about sweat and the rock and all of the kind of emotional things but just as the, the metaphor I mean obviously Camus is like the go-to for the metaphor that involved in Sisyphus like it's it's really really strong, and I think it's really generative because it's diversely applicable. So when I originally made um, that game, I was I was just doodling in my notebook, and it's 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 the classic story for me in terms of creation. Is I just thought of a game where you push the boulder up a hill and it rolls back down, and it, that just amuses me to think that 
a lot of the time, I guess, it's just, I just think it's funny to say that that's a game because it is like it. It is a game because you're exerting effort towards a goal um, and it's hard and maybe challenging and you're doing things that look like you're playing a game, like you're hitting two keys very quickly to exert effort. Um, and then arguably, because you can literally never succeed, it's not truly a game. Um, but that's why it's funny. Um, and maybe this is one where I was trying to be annoying uh, towards the players. But I was like liking to think of players as being kind of in on the joke, right? That they would have the same, the realization that it's eternal and, and impossible. And when I made that first version of the game, um, which includes other uh, punishment myths like Tantalus um, or Prometheus, etc., and I slipped Zeno in there, although that's not actually a, an ancient Greek uh, punishment story. He just deserves to be punished. Um, I started also thinking about how the game form or the simulation form, I guess, computational simulation of those experiences is kind of the perfect way of telling those stories. Like you can tell the story of Sisyphus, but when you tell it, it's not infinite. It's still just a bounded narrative that mm -hmm. has a beginning and an end. Wow. Um, and you can have a, there's a beautiful animation of Sisyphus, I'm forgetting the, the person who created, which, which is beautiful and shows the boulder going up and down, but then it finishes. But a video game is simulating the thing and asking, it's putting you in the position of being subjected to infinite punishment. And it is infinite within some boundaries, right? Because your, your computer is not going to last for an infinite amount of time. It will eventually rust or decay or something or something else will happen. But at least the potential for infinity is is there in the in the computational nature of the piece, and I found that very very powerfully interesting. Um, and I think that metaphorical nature of the myth as well plays into experiences that we have with computers too. Right, that there's often the sense that they're meant to be kind of straightforward and obvious, and yet we keep kind of failing to succeed with them, or we. We keep being asked to do the same thing over and over and over and over again. And so I think that the strength of those metaphors and the, the clarity of those stories um, made me want to keep making them again and again as a mostly for me as a way of exploring different kind of expressive uh, capacities of games again. It's, mm -hmm. it's something that I'm just super interested in. Um, so I became interested in like different ways of basically making the same game, but making it again in a different form and seeing what different kinds of nuances are maybe there. If, for example, I made a, a typing version, which is like Mavis Beacon teaches typing. So you're typing and the faster you type, the faster you push the boulder up the hill, um, which added different kinds of layers to the experience. It, it allowed me to introduce a bit more narrative to it, for example. Or I made a user interface version to connect back to it as if you were doing work where it's about presenting user interfaces as this kind of frustrating infinite struggle that we go about, you know, and this like basically is infinite until we die, right? Is that we will continuously interact with computers and their interfaces until our deathbeds presumably will still be scrolling Instagram or something as we die. Um, and... So it's just, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting how those myths fit on top of different kinds of presentations um, and they kind of stay fresh to me. The other thing that happened actually, by the way, during the time that I made a lot of those games is we'd just had our son, uh, Felix, and it was a way for me to still make work, um, but in a really, really circumscribed kind of way where I didn't yeah. have to come up with new ideas particularly I just had to express the same idea in different forms um, which I found extremely helpful in terms of feeling like I was still making things and thinking about things while also obviously not sleeping very much and um, being obsessed with a, a small child. <laughs> Um, yeah, my, my next question is going to be about uh, the relationships between uh, gaming and, and the art world because mm -hmm. I know you're from I read that in an interview that your parents are art collectors that you, you grew up in the contemporary art world and um, games then like in the past they were not really considered a form of art and I remember that not so long ago it was really a huge thing that was even debated if a cultural institution made a show 
a show about vid video game art or containing video games. Mm. So do you feel that the kind of work that you and other experimental uh, game developers and artists are doing, has it finally been embraced by, by the art world? Or do you feel you're still very much at the margin? Mm. Uh, it's, it's, it's a really interesting question. I mean, I feel like there's a real division between the kind of blockbuster shows like you know there was the smithsonian show um there was the vna did their big show which i was even a part of which was neat for me um there's a difference between those sorts of shows which are at least more a part of the public consciousness and targeted at a broad general audience and then smaller galleries mm -hmm. um or more european galleries often i i would say as well uh, that are that like, they've kind of been showing more experimental video game oriented work for quite a long time. Like it's it's um, it doesn't feel as uncommon or mm. unsupported um, when it comes to smaller scale institutions, maybe. So I feel like there's there's a distinction to be made there between whether you're talking about trying to have this popular cultural image of what art is and are video games art or not. And that's been a very fraught debate, which I think largely sensible people ignore because it's, it's a bit silly um, in general. Um, so I don't feel marginalized at all. But on the other hand, I don't feel like generally speaking, the big shows are actually all that interested in the elements of video games and art production that I am. I think there's a there's a tendency still to be, you know, to be excited about how beautiful the graphics are, for example, or listen to this music. Can you believe that a video game has such wonderful music? Hmm. Blah, blah, blah. And less about work that thinks about, I don't know, the, the formal structures of games or the expressive capacity of games in in weirder ways. Part of that, though, is also that I'm just personally drawn more to conceptual art and formal approaches to art, and that's a that's a personal thing. Um, but I just think it's less interesting to be excited about amazing graphics. It's like um, being excited about photography because it's so realistic or something. Like that's not that's not what's interesting about photography particularly. So I think there's maybe there's some small sense in which it misses the point a tiny bit. Um, but then at the same time, I think all of the curators that I've ever been in contact with totally get it and like they've been getting it for a long time. Um, I'm not sure it matters too much whether, to me personally, whether or not the the big, you know, the big institutions understand what I'm trying to do. Um, in part, just because digital games are still not an amazing fit for the the bricks and mortar buildings where you go and see kind of the pantheon of art mm. uh, they still they still don't sit super well in there i think people are still trying to figure it out um how you install them do they need extra context should it just be a laptop on a plinth um so i've always thought about my work really as being played by people in you know their office or in their bedroom or oh. sitting on a sofa or whatever um and that kind of the art context, the white cube kind of thing has not really played a big part in, in what I think is interesting about, about, about what I'm doing. Actually, you know, the first time I think I wrote that to you, I discovered your work was in Aix-en-Provence in France right. as part of a, the exhibition Gamers. And because uh, the organizers slash curators of the, of the festival were, were very good friends of mine, they just love games. And so like playing your game was really, it was a really nice setting where you were in an armchair and everything was very cozy and you didn't feel, like, the light was right, you didn't feel mm. you were in an exhibition space like very quickly, mm. you just got, um, and yeah. Okay. Um... That sounds good. I'm glad that they were able to to do that. I think that maybe a little too often people get seduced by the the white the white cube and want it to kind of look like it's a normal art show, and then you have like a plinth with a laptop on it, and you're kind of like standing awkwardly in front of it, playing a game. When in fact, that's yeah, it's not how games are are played, and I think you lose some of the relationship between a player and a game when you start taking away the the coziness of, of the situation that's normally the case. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's a good observation. Yeah, just one other thing I will add with, about that festival is that it was started by 
three guys who had just finished art school and they thought, what are we going to do? Like, no one is going to throw money at us. No one knows <laughs> us. No one is going to invite us. So they just made their own festival and it, it worked. They just invited their friends. And, That's and so I good think, when people do that. Yeah, and it's, yeah, yeah, I really like what they do. Anyway, I, I have, uh, let's say, two questions. Sure. Um, so we just talked about the big contemporary art world and I'm going to go in the opposite direction. I was wondering if there are, you know, this kind of bit strange experimental games with rules mm -hmm. and playability that as unusual, that are as unusual as the ones you create. Do you, like, have you, are there games like that who became massive successes? Or do mm. you have absolutely to have the, the the fantastic graphics and uh, perfect right. playability. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's intriguing. I mean, I think that the, the general answer is probably no in the sense that I don't think there's a, any game that I've made where if I charged for it, I would make millions of dollars or something. It's just, it's just, not, it's just not where that work is going. So I think... I think in terms of having mass appeal, which is what you obviously need, generally speaking, in order to um, to make a lot of money, if we if if that's what we're talking about, is the definition mm -hmm. of of success in this in this context. No, 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 no. It's uh, having uh, like uh, getting out of the uh, independent indie. Right. Well, in, indie is also can kind of become um, this massive thing as well. But you know, escape and be being a really surprise success where you are mm. not. You didn't expect people to enjoy it so much, and then the world, the world to spread so fast. I, so I think, like, I think that that one is tricky because I think it's always the case that once something is accepted by a sort of a large part of the population, it kind of becomes obvious to everybody that oh, of course people like that because X, Y, and Z. But I think that there are absolutely are um, games that I would think of as kind of in the experimental vein that were very, very successful. I think that probably the most obvious one that people know maybe the best is something like Papers, Please, where mm. it's, it's definitely an independent title. It's pretty surprising that people were so excited about it because it is, it is like, it is, I mean, going back to it, it is as if you're doing work. It's a representation of labor and doing like what seems like it should be an extremely boring job, which is stamping people's passports. And it's finding the interest in that um, and a lot of pathos in that as well. Um, it's not the case, though, that I would say that it takes that experimental idea all the way, right? Because when people do those jobs, it's not this exciting narrative of spies coming through and bombings and shooting people at the border and stuff. That's not what that job is really like. Um, mm. And of course, that's the direction that I would take it. It would just be relentlessly boring and nothing would happen. Um, but Lucas Pope, you know, is it good. It's an incredible game designer. I mean, his work is unbelievable, really. Um, he kind of found that balancing act, right, between a, an unlikely premise and set of mechanics, which are in some sense boring, and a narrative framing around that, and beautiful, you know, beautiful tiny elements of design that enabled it to f enable people to realize that they thought it was interesting. And maybe that's kind of the story of a lot of the more experimental games that come about is that they're pulling conventional game design into more interesting areas, but still, you know, you still have to acknowledge some of the conventions of design or people won't engage. So something like Undertale is another interesting example that seems like it should be a niche kind of cute little role playing game that sort of inverts a lot of ideas about what it means to fight with somebody. That became a huge success uh, as well. One of the weirder ones that maybe huge success is the wrong word for it, but Cart Life. I don't know if you've if you heard of Cart no, Life. No, I don't know that why. So one. it's a it's it's a few years back now, um, but a very very interesting simulation of. I haven't. It's been so long since I've even played it, but it won the grand prize at the Independent Games Festival. So very very much acknowledged as a great great work by the larger community and and did, I think, okay commercially as well. But it's like just these very, very stripped back, quite depressing stories about hardship and, you know, running a food cart basically, but also having to go home to look after your daughter and like really, really digging into a kind of realism 
um, in play that, again, you don't normally see because games are so often about skating over the surface of all of the, the, the little pieces that make life what life is um, because they think that we want to escape. But then games like Papers, Please, Cart Life, et cetera, are kind of pulling it back towards, well, maybe life itself is actually kind of interesting and we could afford to look at yeah, the life of a passport officer or something like that. So there are these stories of games that you wouldn't necessarily, if somebody pitched the idea to you, you're a passport officer stamping people's passports, you wouldn't say that's a hit, you know, and green light at, at a, Hollywood stu a Hollywood studio kind of thing. But it turns out that it is possible to kind of marry that with game mechanics in a way that people see themselves in and people can be interested in. Yeah, my, my last question is going to be, do you have any upcoming projects, fees or research events that you are working on at the moment? Mm, I'm, I'm quite excited actually about the, the, two, the two things I'm thinking about. I'm very intimidated by both of them, which I'm, I'm hoping is um, a good sign that they're good ideas and that I'm scared to make them real and fail. Um, the first one and the one that I'm kind of actively working on right now is a sequel got a series called the VR series, VR 1, 2, 3. VR 3 was a museum of water where you would go and see different, um, different kinds of water that you could have in a specific game engine. Uh, and it's kind of based on Donald Judd's um, 100, un 100 Untitled Works in Mill Aluminum that's out in Marfa. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I'm kind of continuing the idea behind that one with a game called VR $4.99 which is going to be an exhibition, a uh, virtual exhibition, of course, of things that cost $4.99 um, in the Unity asset store. So Unity is a game engine. Uh, it has a store where you can buy things. Like if you need a horse for your game, you buy a um. horse. And if you need a desert, then you buy a desert. And they all cost different things, but one of the major price points is $4.99. So I'm buying different things and I'm, installing them for people to kind of look at and think about like why does this cost four dollars and 99 cents why is this you know i don't know this fish why does that cost four hundred four dollars 99 but also this giant building costs four dollars 99 etc so that's kind of an exploration of i guess the capitalism of the platform if i want to be highfalutin but also i'm just interested in comparison and inviting comparison it's another one of those situations where I, I think it's neat for the player to do all of the thinking and to just provide kind of a framework um, for thinking about things. So I'm, I'm working on that. The other thing is a little bit less clear, but I'm wanting to make a game that makes you watch a movie kind of by mistake. Um, so it's, it's that like what I want to have is a kind of a framing narrative that seems very exciting. Um, where you're probably a contract killer or some kind of conventional, I'm scared to do it because I don't know how to do that kind of thing, but you're like a killer and you're trying to kill some person, but they're in a theater. And so you're sitting in the back row waiting to kill them. Um, but mean, in the meantime, while you're waiting, there's a movie on. And so like naturally you just kind of end up watching the movie, but you're kind of watching a movie as an yeah. assassin waiting to kill somebody. Um, but in the end, you never get to kill them. You just watch the movie and then that's kind of finishes. And then you've watched a movie instead of killing somebody. That's the idea. I haven't figured out how to do it yet, but that's what I want is accidentally watching a movie in a video game. <laughs>